Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about the negative feedback regulation of blood calcium levels and how that pertains to the activity of osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Okay, so in the previous two videos, we looked at mainly the functions of osteoblasts in bone deposition, so they increase bone mineral density, and then the functions of osteoclasts in decreasing bone mineral density through the process of bone resorption. Okay? Now, osteoclasts can kind of get a bad rap, um, and that's because if you just kind of think about it superficially, they're decreasing bone mineral density, they're degrading bone tissue, and that seems like a bad thing. And if it goes on prolonged, um, it can ca cause osteoporosis, yes, but under normal conditions where someone's not in danger of osteoporosis, osteoclast activity is very important. Calcium levels in the blood need to be regulated very tightly because calcium is extremely important. Here's just a few things that calcium is vital for. Blood clotting. Calcium actually in, helps initiate the blood clotting cascade. Several of the clotting factors, which you have not talked about at this point, absolutely require calcium to function. If you don't have the calcium, then you can't clot the blood, and you'll bleed out, and that's very bad. Also, calcium is important in both muscle contraction and nerve impulses, generating those. If you can't generate nerve impulses or contract muscles, you're also in serious trouble. So those are a few things that calcium is vital for. So it makes sense to tightly regulate those levels. And this is going to be a situation where it's regulated through negative feedback. So first we're going to talk about the situation where there's low blood calcium. Okay. We have a gland right here. The major gland, this one that's kind of orange in color, this is the thyroid gland. Now, the thyroid gland we normally think of as releasing thyroid hormones. However, if you turn the thyroid gland around and look at its back sides of its posterior side, it actually has some glands situated on it. There's actually four of them, I believe, and they're called parathyroid glands. So not thyroid gland, parathyroid gland, because they're sitting right on top of the thyroid. And these parathyroid glands will release a substance called parathyroid hormone, also called PTH. That's what we'll call it from here on out. Now, PTH is released whenever there's a low blood calcium. So these cells are able to sense that. And when there's low blood calcium, they release PTH. Now, PTH's function is to increase blood calcium levels. The major way that PTH is going to do this is by stimulating the activity of these cells called osteoclasts, which we discussed one video ago. Remember, osteoclasts function in moving along the surface of the bone, and they degrade the bone tissue. That is the matrix. They break down the organic part, which really isn't important here, but they break down the inorganic part, that hydroxyapatite, and so in doing so, they release calcium into the blood. And so by stimulating osteoclast activity, they're going to generate calcium that will move into the blood. And so that helps to increase blood calcium levels back up. And that's how PTH functions. It's also worth noting that PTH inhibits osteoblast activity. Okay? It stimulates osteoclast activity, obviously, but it also works synergistically with another hormone called calcitriol or calcitriol. I usually pronounce it calcitriol. So calcitriol is the active form of vitamin D, which you need. Vitamin D is absolutely necessary for the absorption of calcium from the gut. So when we consume a diet that has calcium in it, calcium needs to be absorbed from the gut into the blood, right? However, if you don't have any calcitriol or vitamin D present, you will get absolutely no calcium absorption from the gut. So calcitriol, the active form of vitamin D, is absolutely necessary to absorb that calcium from the gut. Now, the calcitriol doesn't really play any role directly with the osteoclast, but it's worth noting that PTH and calcitriol act synergistically both to increase blood calcium levels back to normal levels. Okay. And of course, PTH is acting on the osteoclast, which release calcium from the bone into the blood.
and that brings the calcium levels back up. That's just negative feedback right there, but that calcium level in the blood needs to be maintained. Okay? So, in other words, when there is low blood calcium, that stimulates bone resorption. Okay? Now, what about the opposite case? What if we have high blood calcium levels? We also don't want them getting too high. So, in contrast, high calcium levels in the blood will stimulate bone deposition. So we're going to deposit that calcium into the bone because it's going to act as a storage reservoir for the calcium. Now, high levels of calcium inhibit release of PTH from the parathyroid gland. Okay, or the parathyroid. So it's only released when it's low. When it's high, these parathyroids don't do anything. However, there's another cell type within the thyroid. So within the thyroid, there are what do we call follicular cells. These follicular cells release thyroid hormone. So there's another cell type within the thyroid called parafollicular cells. These parafollicular cells, you need to differentiate from the parathyroids. The parathyroids release PTH. The parafollicular cells are actually part of the thyroid itself. Okay? And these parafollicular cells are also called C cells. And they're called C cells because they release calcitonin, which starts with a C. So whenever calcium levels in the blood are elevated above normal levels, we need to bring it back down. So these parafollicular cells, also called C cells, release calcitonin. Also, calcitonin is a hormone just like PTH, and what calcitonin does is it stimulates the osteoblast. Now remember what osteoblasts do. They increase bone mineral density by depositing the bone matrix. They function in bone deposition. So in order to deposit more bone matrix, they're going to have to take calcium, which was from the blood, and put it into the bone. And so if you think about what that will do, you're taking calcium out of the blood, putting it into bone, and so that will actually decrease blood calcium levels. So in some ways, the osteoblasts and osteoclasts are actually really more regulating blood calcium levels, and their effect on the bone tissue is more a side effect, if you want to think of it that way. Because maintaining this blood calcium level in a normal range is vital. And so osteoblasts, when they're stimulated by calcitonin, they deposit calcium from the blood into the bone tissue, and that brings blood calcium levels back down to normal levels. So the key here is, when you have elevated blood calcium, that stimulates bone deposition by stimulating osteoblasts through calcitonin. When we had low blood calcium, that stimulates bone resorption, so release of PTH, which stimulates osteoclasts. Okay? And remember, PTH also functions synergistically with calcitriol. All right? So hopefully this video gave you a really good comprehensive look at what happens in each case when we have either low blood calcium or elevated blood calcium. And we see that a different hormone is released and has an effect, positively speaking, on a different cell type of the bone. So hopefully this made sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.